Good afternoon, everyone. Woo! Welcome. I can't believe that we're already at our final program at this ninth annual Smithsonian Food History Weekend. My name is Ashley Rose Young. I'm the historian for the American Food History Project here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And it is my pleasure to be the host of our Cooking Up History series. So uh, this is a very familiar space to me and I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Thank you all for coming out to support us today. I'd like to give a little bit of background of Cooking Up History, very brief uh, remarks on our housekeeping. I'll introduce our wonderful guest chef, and then we'll get started. So Cooking Up History is about an hour long. It's a program where we share a recipe, but we also take this time to talk to each other, to discuss important topics, and with alignment of this year's theme, talk about climate, community, change, and the role of women as climate activists, advocates, knowledge keepers. So we'll be having a wonderful discussion today with our guest chef, Mariah Gladstone. Can we have a round of applause for her, please? <laughs> Mariah is from, uh, she grew up in Northwest Montana. She graduated from Columbia University with a degree in environmental engineering, on point for our theme this weekend and returned home to develop Indigi Kitchen. And that is a teaching tool for revitalizing indigenous knowledge uh, online. So Indigi Kitchen is a combination of indigenous, digital, and kitchen. It's very creative. Mariah has been recognized as a loose indigenous fellow through the First Nations Development Institute, a culture of health leader through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and an MIT Solve Indigenous Communities Fellow. Mariah also completed her master's degree at SUNY ESF through the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. We are so glad to have you here today, Mariah, and I can't wait to kind of to get into our uh, discussion of ecologies, of bison, of three sisters stew, but I have a few more housekeeping remarks before we get to that. If you're on social media, please tag our museum at AM History Museum and use our hashtags for the weekend, hashtag Smithsonian Food, hashtag Smithsonian Women's History, and apropos of our conversation today, hashtag Native American Heritage Month. We will be taking questions throughout the conversation. If you have one, please raise your hand. I'll be keeping a look, an eye out on the audience and we'll call on you and please wait for the microphone. We do have audience members who are joining us live through streaming online and we want them to be able to hear your questions and commentary. So just wait for the microphone and we'll happily answer your questions. I would also like to thank our colleagues at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, especially Michelle Delaney and Sai Mutsani. They worked very closely with us as we coordinated and co-curated this program with Mariah, and we're so happy to have their support. I would also like to thank the uh, Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative Pool, which is providing funding for this program today. And that pool is administered by the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. And last but not least, Cooking Up History is made possible by Dr. Stephanie Bennett Smith with additional support from Wegmans Food Markets. We couldn't do this without them and we're so grateful. So now that we have all of those housekeeping remarks out of the way, let's have another round of applause for Mariah Gladstone <laughs> and finally get going here. Mariah, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? Uh, tell us about your communities. Yeah, I am Blackfeet. Um, I'm, I'm Scuffy Pekani on my father's side and Chalagi or Cherokee on my mother's side. And the dish that I'm going to be making for you guys today is really emblematic of both that rich hunter-gatherer tradition as well as uh, the farming and agricultural tradition um, from my mother's side. So should we dive into it? Why don't it? we dive in? We love getting started with some cooking. So what is the first step in Three Sisters Stew? Yeah, so this dish that I'm preparing today is three sisters stew, um, but actually with an additional um, ingredient of bison meat. Uh, and so three sisters refers to kind of the OG polyculture, which is corn, beans, and squash, plants that have traditionally been planted together across North America because of their benefits to each other as they're growing, but also the ways in which they form a complete protein together. 
what I actually have going on in this pot right now, as some of you can see steam coming off of it, is actually browning uh, some little pieces of bison roast, some bison stew meat, so that it will tenderize as we start to add other ingredients into the pot. Amazing. It smells really good. I'm not sure if you in the audience can smell that yet. It'll waft its way to you soon, but it is looking really good and it's smelling We even haven't better. even added any spices to it or anything. This is just bison meat. Um, so it's good to it's good to have a sense from home, even being in D.C. right now. <laughs> Fantastic. And I mentioned earlier that you grew up in northwest Montana. Can you kind of paint a picture for us? What was that like growing up? Uh, tell us a little bit about your youth. Yeah, so I um, actually grew up across the mountains from the Blackfeet Reservation. So I always spent my summers there, um, but there is, of course, a continental divide that divides my hometown from the Blackfeet Nation where I live today. And so uh, that kind of became my own little diaspora <laughs> away from uh, my home community. But I was very lucky to grow up always with wild game meat from my cousins in the freezer, um, with wild rice that we would get from other family members that came from the Great Lakes region. And then my dad and my grandpa tilled out a little part of our yard so that it could be fenced away from the dogs and I could have a garden. So mm -hmm. I always got to see the magic of seeing seeds come into plants and I could keep those tended by weeding them. I could pull carrots out of the garden and eat them covered in dirt. Um, I could pull corn into the house and you know go through the process of shucking it and dodging earwigs and all of that. Uh, my mom always told me that no self-respecting Cherokee would ever plant a garden without corn. Um, and I thought she was just being kind of mean. Um, until, until I got my seeds from the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank and they had on the packet, no self-respecting Cherokee would ever plant a garden without corn. Cherokee proverb. So I guess that's a real thing. <laughs> So you mentioned the seed bank. Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of seeds to the Cherokee community and what being a steward of those seeds really means, um, you know, for you and, and for your family? Yeah. Um, for so many people that, uh, indigenous people that have practiced farming and agricultural traditions, we have practiced very intentional cultivation of plant species for our environments, for the growing seasons that we have, the humidity, um, the climatological regions that we live in. And so when Cherokee people were moved forcibly by the U.S. government from our homelands in present day Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina area to our present reservation in Oklahoma, we brought our seeds with us. Um, but part of that challenge was also facing new climate, new soil, mm -hmm. new landscapes. And so um, the seeds that we had had to learn to adapt with us as well. And that was something that a lot of tribes had to navigate, that with forced relocations, our seeds had to move with us or we had to trade with tribes in those areas and get new varieties of seeds that worked better in our new homelands. And so that, that was something we navigated. I can tell you that seeds that I get from the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma and their seed bank do not grow particularly well in Montana's <laughs> growing seasons. Um, and so it, it's a little bit more effective for me to grow heirloom varieties uh, from the Mandan and Hidatsa people in North Dakota in Montana, because our growing seasons are very similar and also mm -hmm. very dry um, and, and short in Montana, similar to what North Dakotas are. So. I can tell you that my traditional varieties of seeds from Cherokee Nation don't always work well um, in that community away from right. the Cherokee and Nation And are you today. just seed trading with them, or are there businesses that you go to for those seeds that will grow better in west, uh, west northwest Montana for you? Yeah, it depends. There are definitely um, alliances of native seed keepers, the, the Native Seed Keepers Alliance, um, which maintains um, a big seed bank. There's also individual tribal nations that have their own seed banks that they make accessible to citizens of those tribal nations. So as a Cherokee Nation citizen, I'm able to go to my tribal seed bank, but also I can buy from heirloom and native breeders online. Um, and there are, there are other folks that maintain those seeds as well. And because Indian country is really small, we also trade with each other. We use 
Facebook and send each other seeds and you know everything in that way as well. And um, you know I'm lucky I get to spend a lot of work doing uh, or a lot of time doing this. And so I also have friends that will give me seeds and um, see how well they grow in Montana's climate. So. That's great. I, I love that community network that's built in, familial but also friends and just. Um, sharing that knowledge with each other. So speaking about food, not that we're talking about seeds, but I am wondering what's happening in the pot? How do we know when we've browned the bison enough? What oh, I have this just kind of turned here? down and simmering at okay. this point. So the reason I'm doing this now is just so the bison meat has enough time to tenderize in the short amount of time. So I put it in here so that it can start browning and cook all the way through, um, and then I'll let it slow cook as we add the liquid. But I do want to get started adding some other things. Great. I have some onion cut up, and obviously this is a commercial onion, um, but wild onion varieties are plentiful across the continent. There are dozens of different types of wild onions within that allium mm -hmm. genus that people often will stumble across, even when they're mowing their lawns, they start smelling things smell like onions. Um, it's pretty easy to find wild onions if you start smelling them. Uh, and so they've been eaten, as I mentioned, across the continent. You could use any type of wild onion in this recipe instead. I just cut up a big commercial yellow onion for this one. Um, and I'm gonna add this and start sauteing it into here just so it will um, get translucent. And then I'm gonna also add the squash in here in just a second, okay. but we'll talk about that as well. Great. And so the squash here, there's different varietals obviously when we do add it in here, but which variety is this? And what other kind of substitutes would you recommend? So I love using winter squash in this recipe. I think that winter squash is really beautiful. It has that lovely sweetness. Um, winter squash encompasses any type of squash that has that hard outside skin. So you can think pumpkins, acorn squash. This one particularly is a butternut, but there's of course lots, dozens and dozens of different types of winter squash. And what I love about winter squash is, besides the fact that they're slightly sweet, uh, they have a great tendency to stay good for a very long time just sitting on your countertop. Um, my best friend, actually, I wasn't even home. She opened the door of my house and put a box of Salmon River squash inside my front door. And I came home and I had like eight gigantic Salmon River squash at my house, uh, which is more funny considering she lives two hours away from me. Um, anyway, I kind of got squash bombed and <laughs> so I, took a while to go through all of this squash, um, but those Salmon River squash hung out on my counter in you know, my pantry for the next six months. And I think I finally cut one of them up after about six months and it was still good. So that's what I love about winter squash. Quite different from summer squash, obviously, which are things like zucchini, which you can keep in your fridge for maybe about a week um, and then it starts to get soft. So I love winter squash. It also, uh, it just kind of adds that good sweetness mm -hmm. to this recipe. So how are our onions doing here? Just cooking down a little bit? Yep, I'm just uh, waiting for them to get translucent, um, but I can also um, add, I have some garlic that I've minced up, so I can add some garlic into here in just a second as well. Just trying to add some things for good flavor. Fantastic, and I do love a simple, I hate to say simple, but this is a one pot meal, right? Yeah. and really traditionally for a lot of different native peoples, having a pot of stew in the main lodge and the main home, just kind of simmering throughout the day was very, very common. So anyone can come in from doing work, get a bowl of soup or stew, um, get kind of replenished, their energy refreshed, and it was always kind of on and ready. And so this is something that is very common. Of course, I'm combining bison meat from the Blackfeet um, with three sisters from the Cherokee, um, but it's a very, very common theme to have a nice, easy one-pot meal. And I can imagine on a cold day <laughs> in Northwest Montana, there's nothing better than just a warm, a hot bowl of soup like this. And it's just smelling better and better as the time goes on. The onions and the garlic, now I can smell that too, which is great. 
And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the two sides of your family. You've mentioned the kind of importance of farming to the Cherokee people. And I'm really interested to know a bit more about indigenous growers and how indigenous growers in general are adapting to climate change right now. What are some of the issues that they're facing, whether it's drought, whether it's increased rainfall? How are community members shifting their practices to address climate change? Yeah, um, so climate change is obviously having pretty big impacts on growing season um, as well as precipitation levels. And that has changed the way that a lot of farmers are managing their planting and their harvests and everything else. So um, for some people, I know that um, they have long been working on varieties of plants that work in drought conditions. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, Ramona Farms is an autumn owned uh, farm that's down um, right on the border of the US and Mexico. And they actually grow, I think about four different varieties of tepary beans, which are the most drought resistant mm -hmm. bean. And so they thrive in that hot, dry, southwestern climate. They make sense, and they're able to have successful yields even in these really extended drought periods mm -hmm. that they've been seeing. Uh, some tribes, though, have also actually navigated some of the challenges of relocation and some of the communities that are back in their original homeland. So for example, um, there are several different bands of the Potawatomi people. Some of them have been relocated to Oklahoma and Kansas area, and some of them are back in the original homelands around the Great Lakes in Michigan. And so uh, some of the seeds that grow really well in Oklahoma or have traditionally grown well in Oklahoma are now being stressed out by increasing temperatures, and instead, now they grow better back in the original homelands. Mm. And so those seeds are, in a sense, becoming climate refugees as they're trying to find new places, or rather old places, um, because of wh how that migration took place, where they're able to grow better with other communities of Potawatomi people um, farther to the north. Mm. So there are definitely challenges that uh, climate change is having on native farmers. Another thing that we were talking about previously too is the wild rice harvest among the Anishinaabe people. Can you speak a little bit about your knowledge of that or any community members that you know are, are dealing with the impact on the wild rice harvest? Sure, I'm going to actually add the squash Excellent. into this pot. Cooking step. Uh, <laughs> just so that we can get it going, the squash needs enough time to soften Wonderful. as we're doing this. Uh, we can also hide bowls in the we're sink. We're going to hide bowls in the sink right now. We don't need to see the empty bowls. That's no fun. Um, but yeah, wild rice is actually not a rice. It's actually a grass, um, the grass seed. And it grows in wetland areas around the Great Lakes region. So if you have been to Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, you may have had a chance to taste wild rice. You may know someone that's even gone out and harvested wild rice. And it has traditionally and is still harvested in two-person teams by canoe. Mm. Uh, one person actually uses a long pole to propel the canoe through the water, while another person uses sticks to shake the top of the grass so that the seeds will drop into the canoe. And then it goes through a parching process and, and all of this to remove kind of that papery outside and then um, dry it out so it can be cooked very, very similar to how we cook rice, only it uses a four to one ratio of water to rice, so it expands a ton. Um, but because it grows around the outsides of these wetlands, extended drought periods around the Great Lakes have, of course, decreased the water levels of those wetlands and have really threatened climate change. The other thing, or have really threatened wild rice by the impact of climate change. The other thing I will say is that the other th that's really threatened wild rice is actually people buying lakefront property and saying like, we need easy access for our, our boats to get out mm. to the water. And so they rip up all of this grass, um, which is a food not just for people, it's delicious if you haven't had wild rice, um, but also for birds and its habitat for 
plants and, or for insects and bird species and a whole bunch of other communities as well. And so all of those things are also having an impact on wild rice in addition to the impact drought and climate change mm -hmm. is having as well. It's interesting that you mentioned the impact of human residential development. This is a theme that we discussed in the Gullah Geechee community in our cooking demo with Chef Sally Ann Robinson yesterday, who lives in Dofusky Island, South Carolina. And she spoke about the development of housing along seashores in South Carolina and how that can uh, contribute to the erosion of seafront properties. It can destroy certain sand dunes. It can impact the salt marshes, which are so essential to uh, as nurseries to many kinds of fish and other marine creatures. And she's seeing that impact in her everyday life and Gullah farmers and community members are seeing that impact and the impact of uh, how it reduces the resilience of the land in Dofusky and throughout the low country. So I think that's an interesting parallel that we'll, we're seeing here, which is our impact yeah. on the landscape, uh, mankind's impact on its resilience. Yeah, I mean, speaking of climate change, I'll mention that it also has had huge impact on foragers and people being able to find wild foods in their environment, which leads me to one of my seasonings I'm about to put in, <laughs> um, which is actually yarrow that I brought from home. And I'm not sure who's familiar with yarrow. Um, Can the I science get anyone in the audience familiar with yarrow? All right, we're having a few out there. So the scientific name of yarrow is Achillea millifolium uh, because yarrow is native to the whole northern hemisphere. So stories say that Achilles actually used to take yarrow with him into battle because Blackfeet warriors did the same thing for this exact reason. Uh, if you get wounded, if you get cut, if you have a, an injury that will not stop bleeding, if you mash up some yarrow, if you chew on those yarrow leaves and put that on the wound as a poultice, it'll clot your blood and it will stop you from bleeding. So it's been used in everything from warfare to childbirth, but it also has a flavor profile kind of like tarragon. Mm. You can also make tea with it um, and it grows in relatively um, poor soil conditions. I can find it almost all over the prairies, even in tough drought years. And so I'm adding some of this as a seasoning to the stew, but also as a recognition of some of that other additional plant knowledge. Um, also, it was fun just to bring a whole bunch of yarrow from home on the yes. plane. Uh, I'm also going to add a little bit of cumin because I can, and I like it, and I want it in this stew. So I'm adding these things. I love that, your own spin. You, as we were talking ba about backstage, with Three Sisters Stew, there are a th thousands of iterations of Three Sisters Stew, and I like that you bring your own flair to this one. So you added also a little bit of salt and pepper prior, I did, yeah. prior to the yarrow. I think this is a good point in the program where if there's a question from the audience, we can take that now. And I just ask you to wait for the mic. Um, and one of our staff members will bring that to you very shortly. I see a question here I'm on this add side. add that I'm going to add some vegetable broth into here okay, just so you guys great. don't think I'm not letting you in on my secrets. I wanted to ask, what's the difference between soup and stew? Mm what I decide to call it that day. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know the I technical don't know difference. <laughs> In kind of colloquially, I think of soup as a little more broth heavy and stew is cooked down a little bit more, a little more congealed, a little thicker, but do you have a, it's just kind I of I would say potato, sometimes potato. I say stew has meat, but I use stew for things that don't necessarily have meat either. So I, I, don't, I don't have a hard and fast yeah. rule for that. Maybe there's a, Webster's dictionary sure definition is. that someone can yell at me with, but <laughs> I don't I don't know it, so I use both. There you go. Three sisters st soup, three sisters stew. You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> I don't care. I see we have another question in the front row. Oh, back there first. That's great. How you doing? Um, Hello. Is uh, is there like a repository for like indigenous recipes mm. and? Um, is there any effort being made for maybe recipes that have been lost to be found? Um, so, follow me for more recipes. No, that's, <laughs> that's kind of the founding premise of why I started Kitchen was to make more indigenous recipes Googleable. Mm -hmm. There are definitely a lot of cookbooks that feature native recipes, um, but I also wanted to add information to more of a digital archive so that we could have access not just to really traditional recipes, but also to 
recipes using traditional ingredients that we can make in our modern kitchens, that we can make when we get home from work at the end of a busy day, things like that. Um, and so there is a lot of work being done in the food sovereignty movement to recover recipes that I won't say lost, um, but I will say have been taken from us because the effort to disconnect native people from our traditional food systems has been very intentional. Mm -hmm. um, that work to decimate bison populations, that work to dam rivers and stop fish from coming up rivers, stop seasonal floods from irrigating agricultural land, that work to relocate tribes away from the places where their foods grew, that work to partition reservation lands into 160 acre parcels where you're not allowed to forage outside of your family's plot. Uh, all of that was very, very intentional and you know, you can read the 1850 Commissioner of Indian Affairs report that wrote, it is cheaper in the end to feed the whole flock for a year than to fight them for a week. Essentially saying, we as the United States government should destroy native food systems to force people to depend on government rations. And that's essentially very much what happened. And so this work that's being done now to recover a lot of this knowledge, um, is work that we're doing because we were forced to depend on government rations and subsidized food systems for so long. So uh, yes, that's happening. I try to make cooking videos to go with a lot of that. I'm interviewing elders to put that information on my website at indigikitchen.com. There's my shameless self-promotion. Um, but also um, just to make that information accessible to native people that may not otherwise have access to it, but also to non-native people that are just interested in connecting with cool indigenous knowledge, sense of place, stewardship of the land, all of those additional mm. factors. Great question, thank you. And I think we have um, some more questions over here on this side of the audience. So I'm intrigued by your reference to Salmon River squash. Can you tell me a little more about it? Oh, uh, Salmon River squash is an heirloom variety of winter squash that comes from the Salmon River region of Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where my best friend got the seeds from. I don't know, but she, she grew them in Montana. They did really, really well, and they're delicious. They're just about as sweet as a butternut, and I think you might be able to order seeds for them online. They're, uh, they're kind of round. Um, they're green but they kind of have like an additional little bump on them, almost like a buttercup squash. Not a butternut, but a buttercup. Yeah, kind of like bigger versions of, or at least hers were bigger <laughs> versions of buttercups. So, um, but they were really good. And yeah, they, they cooked up just like a, a butternut squash. They're really sweet. So they worked out well. And I used them in the soup a couple of times when I couldn't find butternuts at my local grocery store. And also because I had a ton of them. I used about half of one of them to equal what a butternut was. There so. you go. And we have another question over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, as one who grew up in Montana, um, we learned nothing, little, about indigenous culture and um, in our school. So thank you for doing this. And <coughs> I'm aware that there's some emerging large-scale projects for um, on the prairies that are happening both with some of the tribes and also the huge prairie um, project. Are any of these incorporating, and I just wonder if you could tell us about how the food element, because I'm especially intrigued beyond the bison, the other you know, sources of food and how mm -hmm. some of that might be emerging and being used today. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think you're probably talking about the American Prairie Reserve project that's happening. Um, I know that that's gotten quite a bit of media attention because it's been somewhat controversial, um, at least back in Montana. Um, but yeah, so fortunately now we also do have Montana Indian Education for All in our schools, um, which has been part of our state constitution since the 70s, um, but only, only within the past, uh, couple decades has received funding. Um, and so now there's more Indian ed being taught um, in all subjects, not just social studies. But to address the question, I, I think that 
There is a lot more effort being made to recognize traditional indigenous land management that has taken place in these spaces. Um, so Blackfeet people, for example, did a, a lot of burning practices as part of our land stewardship, as part of the ways in which we manage those landscapes. Um, in the late fall, around this time when the grasses were dry but you weren't in danger of starting large fires, uh, we would set fire to the old prairies. And so, you know, that would burn off a certain section of the prairie, it would get rid of that dead foliage on top of the surface. And then of course in the springtime, that big blackened part of the prairie would attract sunlight, you guys know, black attracts heat, the soil warms up, that warming temperature of the soil increases uh, or speeds up the germination of the annuals, it starts the perennials waking up, and then you get a big green patch of grass in the middle of otherwise fairly dry grass left over from the year before. And then that also invites a lot of animals to come and feast right on that which is great for hunters in the springtime. Um, but also there's a lot of plant species that actually rely on those low intensity burns to help their seeds germinate. So for example, prairie turnips, which are great. They're like a low glycemic potato that grows on the prairies. Uh, they actually relied on that type of low intensity burn or several freeze thaw cycles to break their seed coats and to help them germinate. In the absence of prairie fires, what we're seeing is not only a reduction in some of those plant species, but we're also seeing a transition from really healthy grassland areas to more of a shrubland ecosystem. So we're seeing the dominant species shift from rough fescue grasses to more shrubby sinkfoil, sagebrush, and wild roses. So there's a transition that has happened in the absence of prairie fires that were part of land management. Um, there's also, of course, just the addition of bison on the prairies and the impact that they have on the ecosystem. So there's some cool peer-reviewed research that's coming out of the Konzu Biological Station in Kansas. It's old growth prairie. And they set up different test plots. One that says, here's bison. We're going to let them graze year round on this old growth prairie. Here's another test plot. We're going to let cattle graze here during the growing season, here's another test plot. We're not gonna let any large grazers into this area. And what they found was the test plot that had bison grazing year round, actually over a 30 year period, doubled the biodiversity of that landscape from the test plot that had no large grazers. And the cattle was somewhere in the middle, right? So the impact that bison have on the prairie ecosystems is not just important to keeping bison populations alive, but also is really important to the biodiversity of that ecosystem. And I could dive into bison wallows and cool microclimate or cool microecosystems and their hooves aerating the soil and all sorts of cool things about their saliva making plants grow faster. But um, they're really a, an important keystone species on the prairies. And then of course you can also get into, you know, the 14 different varieties of edible berries that we have in Montana, um, the dozens of different types of root vegetables that we have, the herbs and spices, you know, everything from peppermint to bee balm to yarrow to raspberry leaves that we can use not just as seasonings in our food, um, but also as healthy medicinal teas, as all these different ways of maintaining indigenous knowledge, but also in recognizing those gifts that are coming from the landscape and that sense of um, responsibility that we have to give gifts back mm -hmm. and to take care of that landscape because it's taking care of us. That was a, an amazing answer. I, I feel know, like I, 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 I don't know <laughs> how to answer questions in a short way, my bad. And now I'm wanting to know like so the saliva, the properties of saliva of bison are increasing. Yeah, there's actually <laughs> enzymes in bison saliva that help plants grow more. Uh, which is super cool. They, they co-evolve together. So g having that grazing animal, even cattle on the landscape actually helps those plant species recover. If you graze down about 50% of that biomass of the above, uh, above ground uh, plants, mm -hmm. and then you let the bison move on. Bison move on pretty naturally. They're wild. They don't hang out for too long. Um, if you intentionally move cattle and you keep a rotational grazing schedule, it actually encourages more root growth, it encourages more above soil growth, 
and um, there's a way to manage cattle more like bison so that they can also have positive effects on those landscapes as well. Right, and so you did mention, and I'm so glad you did, the intentional decimation of bison. Yes. But their, their populations have been recovering. So where do they stand now in this larger context of climate change? And yeah. are their numbers back to a, a level of yeah. sustainability and resilience? Or are they being impacted by changes in the climate? that are happening in the landscape around them? Yeah, so good question. Um, these are really big numbers and it's hard to grasp these numbers, especially without having like a graph chart <laughs> in front of you guys. Um, but before colonization, estimates of the number of bison on the prairies were about 60 million. And by the time Montana became a state in 1889, that number had dropped to less than a thousand. So all bison on the continent, all plains bison on the continent descended from that bottleneck. So at some point they bred them with cattle. So there's a vast majority of the bison alive today that are actually beefalo um, because there were some cattle genetics mixed in so that they would not all become inbred bison. Um, there are some pure bison populations that are around uh, specifically in Yellowstone National Park as well as Elk Island National Park. The Elk Island National Park up near Calgary, Alberta actually came from a herd that was originally on the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, we actually got some of those bison rematriated mm -hmm. back to the reservation. And then this year in June, uh, the Blackfeet tribe actually released about two dozen of those bison back to the wild. So for the first time in 150 years, the Blackfeet Reservation has wild wow. bison back on the landscape. Um, and of course we have um, a friendly relationship with Glacier National Park and they're like, oh, if the bison want to come into the park, of course they can come into the park. So now I know um, my ranger friends will have to call in buffalo jams in addition to bear jams and elk jams and anything else that people stop for on the roadways up there. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really a nice thing to be able to have bison back on the land. Now we also have a tribal herd, which is about 700 animals. Um, but every tribe in Montana has their own tribal herd. Dozens of other tribes around the country also have their own tribal herd. Uh, we actually, at Black Cleat people, get some of theirs processed at a USDA inspected facility, so it's also offered in our local grocery store. R overall, I think we have about 500,000 bison on the continent today, so they're no longer in danger of going extinct, but also that's still a far cry mm -hmm. from 60 million. Um, I will say that we were able to find bison roast in DC, so that's pretty cool. I thought I was gonna send some from home, um, and then Kathy came up with bison yes, roast. Our so wonderful I was like, awesome. kitchen so manager, Kathy Fung, worked with our cafe downstairs. Yeah. They've actually been preparing bison uh, for Native American Heritage Month, so we were very lucky to we have some on hand for that. So speaking of bison, we keep pointing back at this, the <laughs> soup pot here, the stew pot. What's going on with the soup right now? We're just trying to raise it, raise the temperature. Yeah, I want the squash to cook until it's nice and soft. And of course I want my bison meat nice and tender, but I can add these other ingredients. Um, these are actually beans, they've already been cooked, so I'm not stressing about making sure that they get cooked, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, for three sisters soup, you can use any different type of beans that you want. Um, these are just some simple white beans. Um, and then this is actually a blue corn hominy. Um, so this was prepared ahead of time. Most folks don't realize that despite so many cultures in on this continent being corn based, they weren't eating corn as sweet corn, right? Um, it was traditionally being eaten as a nixtamalized corn or nishtamalized, um, N-I-X-T-A-M-A-L-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Uh, that X sound makes the sh if you're pronouncing it more in the traditional Aztec way, which is where that word comes from. And then of course tamal, you guys will probably recognize because it's important to the making of tamales. Um, ization, so nishtamalization is the process of treating corn, okay, we're about to go to chemistry lab, yeah. with a Excellent. highly alkaline solution. Um, so high pH, we're raising the pH. Um, now it's done with culinary lime but you can also do this with wood ashes and water. If you add wood ashes to water, it raises the pH, you create lye, and if you add corn to it, it chemically removes the hull of the corn. Mm. 
It also adds a lovely smoky flavor if you're using wood ashes. Uh, this was made with culinary lime, so no, no lovely smoky flavor, but still, it makes the corn way more digestible. So you guys probably know the corn is not super digestible if you just eat it. Um, this turns the bound niacin into free niacin as well. So when corn was brought back to Europe, through Columbus and then through other trade routes in Europe, um, a lot of peasants started eating corn. But of course, they didn't bring this way of treating corn back with them to Europe because in Europe, they already had big mechanical grinding mills. They're like, we can just throw this dried corn right into a mill. It'll grind it into flour, corn meal, right? And then we'll bake it into bread. We'll cook it into polenta, whatever. None of that's nishtimalized. And so they weren't getting any of the niacin out of their corn. For peasants that were primarily just eating grain-based diets, like corn, previously wheat and barley, they were suddenly no longer getting niacin, and they started getting a disease called pellagra. Pellagra is a niacin deficiency. One of the severe uh, symptoms of pellagra is that when you step out into the sunlight, your skin is severely photo or UV sensitive, and you'll create like horrible burns on your body just by stepping out into the sun. If you have pellagra, you tend to avoid the sun. From this entire period of peasants eating a lot of corn, but not using traditional indigenous knowledge that came with the corn, uh, we got the entire vampire mythology that came out of this. So I know it's a little late, but happy belated spooky season. <laughs> I'm going to add this corn before I go off on some other tangent. Uh, this is blue corn hominy, of course. So um, the corn itself is, is a lovely blue color. Um, but you can use any type of dried corn to do this. And you can do this. At, you can make hominy very easily at home um, just by having access to culinary lime or wood ashes, I guess, if you have a wood stove. Go for it. All right, so we're getting that in there. And we also talked about beans. At one point, we did add vegetable stock, and you just used two cartons, right? And I then did, some and more then, water. yeah, I added some more water to it because I had a lot of meat and squash, and I, I just needed more water to really balance out exactly what I was going for. Um, so I'm just letting everything simmer in this pot is what I'm doing. Um, and and then when we bring it up to a simmer, how long do you keep it simmering for? Like 15 minutes, two hours, you know, <laughs> what's, what's your go-to? My go-to is when I can stab the squash with okay. a fork and it is soft. <laughs> there you go. Um, for the purposes of this, probably like it would be about 40 minutes from when you put the squash right. in um, and just kind of let it cook until it's nice and soft. If you have giant chunks of squash, they could take longer. Smaller chunks could be shorter. If you are someone that put your squash in the microwave so that it was way easier to cut, could be shorter, mm -hmm. right? There's mm -hmm. lots of different factors. So when the squash is fork tender, or because this is also one of those recipes that you can kind of just keep in a slow cooker or a crock pot, and you can help yourself to soup throughout mm -hmm. the day, you can also just kind of let it go. Um, it also freezes really well, and it's just a nice, lovely thing to have around in cold, rainy, snowy winter months, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. You know what? I realize I didn't even talk too much about the Three Sisters. Let's talk about the Three Sisters. I, I mentioned what they were, <laughs> um, but not necessarily why that's super important. Um, so I mentioned there's a lot of different varieties of Three Sisters, but the purposes of planting Three Sisters together are, of course, that corn grows tall and straight, right? Beans, if you've planted pole beans, you recognize they need a trellis. Um, if you plant them, a week or two after you plant the corn, they can actually use that early corn stalk as a trellis, and they will continue growing up the corn and using that as their support system to grow taller, to produce more, to reach more sunlight. Uh, the squash, if you've been in a pumpkin patch lately, if you've planted zucchini in your garden, you probably realize that squash spreads out everywhere on the ground. It has these big, long vines. It has these great big leaves that shade the ground and prevent evaporative loss mm -hmm. from the soil. So it helps keep more water in the soil. And also, it shades the ground in a way that prevents sunlight from reaching down and competitor weeds from having access to that same sunlight. It also, I don't know if you've touched pumpkin vines um, or zucchini vines, they kind of have these irritating hairs. There's some bug species that don't necessarily like to touch those either, so it helps keep pests mm -hmm. off the other plants. And then, of course, beans are a legume. So they contain 
root nodules with nitrogen fixing bacteria in them that will pull nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil and will help replenish that really important nutrient that corn and squash are both feeding heavily off of. So they all really work together to support each other, both chemically, physically, and then nutritionally, of course, as well. Even if I didn't have uh, bison in this soup, it would be a complete protein because of all those different factors. Also, there's some really cool research that comes out of Cornell University from Jane Mount Pleasant, who actually did crop yields based on uh, traditional Haudenosaunee Three Sisters planting. And she said, here's a hectare planted traditional Haudenosaunee style. And then she did each other test plot. She did these test plots in monoculture. So what if we just had corn? What if we just had beans? What if we just had squash? And then she went through and she calculated these crop yields based on calories and protein per hectare. And what she found was that Three Sisters planting produces more per area than any one of those produced in a monoculture. I will also say that her research recognized that native people also were eating those seeds of the pumpkins as well, right? They were saving some of those, um, but then also consuming a lot of these because there's, of course, very high in protein, um, good potassium in, in squash seeds, lots of good benefits. Also, pumpkin seeds are a natural dog dewormer. If you can get your dog to eat pumpkin seeds, there you go. Also great for dogs. Uh, I really need a notebook up here so I can take like all of the kitchen wisdom that you are sharing. I don't know if that's that kitchen goes wisdom. Far beyond the kitchen itself, yeah. I feel yes. like I'm more likely to go on ecology or chemistry rants, but yeah, kitchen wisdom. We'll go with that. I, no, I love it. Dog I love care. It. <laughs> so I had one more question for you before I turn things back to our audience to ask uh, some more yeah. questions. But I wanted to go back to Blackfeet traditional hunting grounds, where they're hunting bison right right now, and then talking a little bit about how um, bison are being impacted by snowfall and climate change and elk. And so I was hoping you could speak a little bit about that topic. Yeah, so obviously, given the fact that we have not had wild buffalo on Blackfeet lands for the last 150 years, we're not planning on hunting those two dozen that we released for a little while. We're gonna wait until that uh, herd grows quite a bit. Uh, we do have really healthy elk and moose and deer populations as well as antelope on our reservation. And um, that subsistence hunting culture is still very much part of Blackfeet livelihood. Um, but also one of our earliest treaties, the Lambel Treaty actually guarantees Blackfeet hunting rights all the way down to the Yellowstone River. Um, and so that's about a, I don't have any concept of distance in Montana. We measure distance in hours. So um, I can tell you it's a six hour drive driving about 70 miles an hour. Um, but we do have hunting rights down to the Yellowstone River. So just north of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, we obviously can't hunt in the National Park, but the state of Montana recognizes that treaty, or at least they've started to recognize it over the past 10 or so years. Um, and so Blackfeet hunters have the ability to travel down to Yellowstone and when those bison, if those bison migrate outside of the park to a specific area of public land, we're able to buy tags through our tribal fish and wildlife department and go and harvest bison. However, uh, in years where we don't have really high snowfall, if the snowpack isn't high enough that the bison decide to leave Yellowstone. If you've been to Yellowstone, it's a volcano, right? It's a very large volcano, but you're pretty high elevation. If it gets cold, the bison come down off the volcano. They migrate outside of the park to go find more food. Um, that's when we have access to them for hunting. And I think about two years ago, they really didn't want to come out of the park um, because the snowpack levels actually they did in April, but that was after our hunting season. <laughs> so um, when we finally got a big snowfall, but um, last year the snowpack stayed relatively consistent and the bison were able to migrate outside the park. What's interesting about that is even though we're on state of Montana lands, that hunt is regulated by Blackfeet game wardens, but also we're not the only tribe that has hunting rights there. There's, I think about, six or seven mm. other tribes that have hunting rights. So sometimes you'll go down there and you won't see a Blackfeet game warden, but you'll see 
a Crow game warden, or you'll see um, a game warden from Salish and Kootenai Nation. And so you'll see different game wardens, but they're not enforcing black. It's very interesting. And then you might see a state of Montana game warden, but they are just there to kind of check things out, make sure safety protocols are being followed, different things like that. Um, but we buy our tags through our own tribal nation. So that is a way that we exert mm -hmm. sovereignty. Um, but also, yeah, mentioning that climate change impact within there as well, because um, that is something you never quite know when the bison are going to migrate out of the park. Sometimes we'll get a call and it's snowing, it's snowing in Yellowstone, and then we can all load up and drive six hours and hope the bison come out. It's an interesting adventure. Um, so. so you're saying like as we're having global warming and snowfall may not be as great, the bison are just staying in Yellowstone, yep. not moving beyond. Yeah. Okay, so tied to kind of that element of climate change, global warming, or at least impact on snowfall. Not yes. Not coming down as heavily. Yes. I will also mention that even if the bison don't come out of the park, the, the park service will still call the numbers because there's so many bison in the park. So from an indigenous perspective, we're much happier if we're able to utilize that meat um, to feed our people rather than those just being culled by the park service in order to keep healthy populations inside the park. We would also be very happy if we could take some of those bison that would otherwise be culled and help replenish some of the genetics within our own gene pools on our tribal herds as well. Um, and then that gets into kind of a complicated jurisdictional thing with transporting bison um, because not everyone's a fan of bison being transported um, on state highways. Mm. I'm not gonna get into that, but it, it is a thing. Uh, <laughs> That is the thing. Well, thank you for sharing that information too. And as I promised, I want to give our audience members a chance to ask more questions. So if we could have our Smithsonian team members bring around those microphones, uh, we'll take, you know, we have about 10 minutes or so to, to take some more audience questions. Thank you. Um, the question about the yarrow yeah. plant. So where does it only grow in certain areas? Why does it cause clotting? And can I buy it like at a local supermarket dried or how does it come? I don't know if you can buy it at a local supermarket dried. I know there's definitely online places you can get it from. Um, there's some different herb stores where you can find yarrow. Um, I all of my nerdy knowledge and I can't tell you what the exact compound is that causes the clotting, but I know there's definitely peer reviewed studies on it. So I should look it up so that I have that knowledge in the future. I can't tell you right now, um, but it, it's a great plant even um, to, as a container plant in your house or on your front. Um, it depends, so y I can almost always find it at my local garden store. There's some different varieties. At home, the wild ones that we have have white flowers, sometimes pink flowers, but I've been able to go to garden stores and find them with yellows and reds and, and pinks and orange, like they're very lovely. Um, Yep, anything above ground, you can cut and dry, hang upside down, and then um, I have a jar of it, and so they were, they were smelling it earlier. They're like, this sounds like it would make a, this smells like it would make a great tea. And yes, it does make a great tea, um, but it's also super easy to grow. It doesn't require a lot of effort. Um, as I said, I'll go find it. I, I find it growing in the woods um, as well as the prairies. I can almost always find it in different places. And it's a, it's a nice handy plant to have around. Um, sometimes I'll even, if I'm hiking, I have some tucked in my first aid kit. Even if it's dried, um, you can still put it in your mouth for a second, rehydrate it, and um, it'll still stop the bleeding. So it's a good plant to have around. And I've gotten real bougie and made yarrow aioli with it before. So, you know, no limitations. <laughs> I love that. We have another question in the back. Uh, my mom's a chef, so she's texting me all these questions. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, how does, uh, from between Blackfoot heritage and Cherokee heritage, how did food storage work out? Ooh, good question. So primary method traditionally of food storage uh, was drying things. So uh, for Blackfeet people, that meant making a lot of dry meat, right? And so that's, you know, thinly slicing meat and then air drying it. People still air dry meat, you know, you hang strings across the ceiling of your living room and you can air dry meat and it's totally food safe. And that is still very, very common. Um, so it's, 
like jerky, only you get even more moisture out of it so that it's totally safe for long-term storage. Um, at that point, sometimes black feet people would take it a step further and you'd actually grind that dry meat into like almost a dust and then you mix it with dried berries. So again, we would dry gallons and gallons of different berries that we had. Um, and then you blend those two ground up things together and you add enough tallow, animal fat, so that they would stick together. And then you have something called pemmican, which is basically protein, carbs, and fat. It's like a perfect food. It will stay good forever. And super lightweight, packable, great travel food. And it's slightly sweet from the berries, and it's like rich from that meat, but it really has kind of that perfect blend of macros. Um, so that traditionally drying practice still even today. Now a lot of people will keep our berries in our freezer, right? We've got big chest freezers, so we'll keep berries in there. Um, that's a lot more common. Now I try to save my freezer space for meat, um, and so I will still like lay a whole bunch of trays out and dehydrate berries if I can. Um, for Cherokee people, even with winter squash, that would traditionally be dried. So as I mentioned, you can keep winter squash. It's good for months on your counter. Or you can also cut that squash up. Have you guys ever seen like a, of course you guys have seen a slinky, right? So you can cut up a squash, a zucchini or a winter squash. You cut it like a slinky essentially. So you're increasing that surface area and you can hang that from a place in your living room. If you live in a really dry climate like I do, we can dry a lot of things in our living rooms. Um, if you have dogs that are not great at jumping, it can be on your ceilings. Um, <laughs> different, different strategies work for different people. Uh, but I will also mention that not everyone lives in a really dry climate. I've been in DC in the summertime. <laughs> it doesn't really work out. Um, and so I, I, so I went to grad school in central New York. They have huge salt deposits there. So salt drying was much more common. Smoking things, we have plentiful hardwood forests. We don't have that in Montana. So smoking things was a lot more common as a preservation method. Um, just that cool smoking kind of gave enough dryness that it was able to preserve food long-term. Um, I will also mention that, so corn, right? Corn would traditionally be actually shucked to a point where it had like one or two husks left on it and then those husks would be braided. So you'd have basically a garlic braid but make it corn and then you would hang that up and you would dry it until that corn was just rock solid and you could twist the corn kernels off. In that process, depending on your humidity in that time of year, sometimes some of your corn would get moldy. And if you mix that moldy corn in with your other corn, you have a whole bunch of moldy corn, that's not good. Uh, this process of nichetimalization that I was mentioning also kills any of those pathogens. So that was also really important to food safety as well mm. for long-term storage. That's kind of an extended rant, but yes, drying, um, but also now freezing. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Other questions from the audience? I see some in the back here. All right, so food has been a big source of pain throughout history. Can you talk about how the work you do helps to bring healing to communities and um, crosses barriers? Sure thing. Um, so yeah, so for indigenous nations on this continent, losing our access to our traditional foods, our ability to feed ourselves, uh, was used, unfortunately, as a huge way of controlling us. Um, for Blackfeet people, uh, we had one winter where the rations didn't arrive and actually a quarter of our population starved to death because we no longer had access to our buffalo herds. We no longer were able to go and harvest things traditionally. We lost 25% of our population. And so in the years that followed, our leaders made decisions to sell off some of our reservation lands so that we could get the money to be able to buy food so that we would never face that again. Um, some of the lands that were sold included what's now known as the eastern half of Glacier National Park. Um, so where I sit in my living room, I can see out my window, I can see Chief Mountain, which is the most sacred of all of our mountains. It lies exactly, the summit's exactly on the border of Glacier and the reservation. Um, when that was sold, um, there was one of our leaders that said Chief Mountain, 
is my head. Now my head has been cut off. Um, and so I look out my window and I can see our most sacred mountain, which was sold um, essentially so that we could buy food so that we could have future generations of Blackfeet people. Um, food is not, not just a tool of nutrition and feeding ourselves and all of that, which it is, um, but it's also part of our political sovereignty. It's about our ability as a nation to be able to take care of ourselves, to be able to take care of our people. It's about maintaining the ecological health of our landscapes. And for me, seeing that, um, I also see the value that my ancestors placed on my life and saying it was worth selling that so that I could be here today. That's a huge sense of value, but also purpose and responsibility. To do that work, to restore what needs to take place um, so that we can not just recover our ability to feed ourselves, but also those places as well. Thank you for that answer and that explanation. I'm wondering, we have probably time for one, maybe two more questions. I'll try so to be short in my answers. No, the <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't, because I'm, I'm really enjoying, um, I'm learning so much from you and I'm sure our audience is too. Uh, I'll let Dan choose whomever is gonna ask the next question. So I have a, que I have a question about the corn process, which I'm not gonna pronounce correctly. Um, so I've tried for the last two years to grow Cherokee heirloom corn here, one yep. year more successfully than the other. Um, but my guess is part of the reason it didn't taste great is the not having done the process that you discussed. Is yep. that something in you know just my kitchen at home that I can yeah, do? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, if you find culinary lime, which you may be able to find at like a local um, Mexican food store or, or Latin American food store, something like that, or you can order it online. Um, but culinary lime, and then there's a ratio, depending on how much corn you have or how much, you can look all of that up. Just look up how to make hominy. And then you can add that dried corn, and I'll tell you, like, that process, I can smell the corn more than anything else in the soup right now, and it smells delicious. <laughs> um, I, someone else did the prep work on this, and she's like, did I do this right? And I was like, it smells amazing. Yes, you did. That's someone uh, else's, our kitchen manager, yes, Kathy. Kathy Thank yes. you, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy crushed it, um, and it's perfect. And yeah, but look up how to make hominy and get culinary lime, and you can do it really easily at home. Um, just make sure that you're using like a nice like heavy-duty stainless steel pot or something like that rather than like a, a non-stick thing, because you are playing a little bit with chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, so if you also think that you're aggressively stirring and gonna splash, like put on some gloves so you don't base burn yourself. There you go. You probably won't, you're probably fine, but <laughs> it does help. So I think we're gonna start to draw the program to a close. I would like to say, if you have any other questions for Mariah, uh, she will be around after the demonstration so you can chat with her for a little bit. So don't worry if you didn't have a chance to uh, ask your question. But Mariah, I really want to thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself and your community stories, your culinary knowledge, your engineering and ecological knowledge, your chemistry info, I feel like how to cure worms and a dog I might have at some point in the future. Um, it's, it's been a fantastic program and the soup looks amazing. Can we get a round of applause for our guest chef? So, so wonderful. And I'd like to hand things over to our wonderful director of the American Food History Project, uh, Paula Johnson, who's going to just provide some final closing remarks for our ninth annual Smithsonian Food History Weekend. And thank you, Mariah. As Ashley said, it was just an amazing program and we are all the richer for it. Yeah. I know, we definitely, I'm trying not to cry on stage, but as I'm listening to your community stories, I was tearing up because it is really moving. So again, thank you for, for sharing that with us. And our team is so um, connected that I see Ashley tearing up <laughs> and I tear up. Okay, so where's Valeska and Kathy and Kathy um, and Steve and Jackie, um, all of those Smithsonian staff members who have uh, put this program together. Very, very grateful to all of you and to all of the people who have been tuning in online and who have shown up here in D.C. Uh, for this uh, ninth annual 
um, extravaganza dedicated to food history. Thank you so much. We really uh, cannot tell you how much we appreciate gathering with you around food history and the future. So thank you again, and um, bon appetit. Yeah. <laughs>